edition of Off the Beaten Path. Today, we are at Vino Nocero in Plymouth, California. This winemaker I've been following for well over a decade. And I'm pleased and honored to finally have the opportunity to talk and share ideas, experiences, and thoughts with the man behind their wines, Rusty. Rusty has been winemaker here pretty much from the inception. And the thing I've noticed the most about the wines they put out um, are their striking consistency over multiple vintages. If there's one place you can come to and expect and get a solid Sangiovese, it's here at Vino Nocero. And that's where I always look to for a Sangiovese. Today we're gonna go behind the scenes and uh, spend some time with Rusty. So let's go check on him in the cellar. Rusty, nice to finally meet you. Nice to meet you too, right? <laughs> I've been enjoying your wines for a long time now, probably over well over a decade. I'm assuming you were the one making all those wines this whole time. Uh, I've been here at Nocero since 1999. Wow. Yeah. And I've wow. go back with them to their first vintage. Wow. In when? 1990. Wow. So I've worked incredible. the previous wine, winery where I worked. We did there from 1990 to up to till 1995, and then they had their wines made at other wineries for a little bit, right. and then in somewhere in 97, 98, they thought, you know, we got to have control of our own destiny. Yeah, and plans were built to build this, and I came over to them just before harvest of, of March of '99. So wow, man, I'm <laughs> I'm honored to see, you know to, to to share a few minutes with you here today. Um, you know, one thing that stood out the most of your wines, I probably, I started, I first had your Sangiovese well over a decade ago. And uh, one thing I've noticed is how consistent it is. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that can be tough. That, that, that wine there is, is, of course, our flagship wine. Yeah. But for, you know, when we first started, we only had the, the vineyards out on the highway up by where you know just up there and so that was uh, Dos Oakies and it was the Il Fujon clone uh, cuttings from there and then uh, the Marmolada got planted or Pepe which is uh, Beyond De Sante yeah. and then in the mid 90s hillsides were put in and, and to have these vineyards grow and get older and still kind of try and keep it consistent has been real wow, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we did several years ago, we did a 20 year vertical and it was amazing to see. They were oh, different because of the age and whatnot, yeah, different yeah. winemakers and whatnot over here, but there's still a little bit of, oh yeah, we get what this is. Yeah. And then in 99, we planted um, uh, our Noche No block out here with all the clones that we have and to incorporate that in all of a sudden we had brand new vines again and whatnot. <laughs> so our, our Sangiovese there, it can be up to 20 plus different lots of wine. You can see all these pungents and barrels in here. We ferment it different. Each, each clone yeah. gets fermented just a little bit different. Wow. So we're so, able to like that. So you blend at the bottling? We bent blend uh, about June. Okay. Okay. So the 2020 version here will bl blend up around say June okay. and then that will go back together and we won't bottle that till March of 2021, 22, I should, sorry, 2022. Wow. So we kind of put some together and then we let it sit because it's like, you know, like lasagna or something. Yeah. It's usually better the next day. <laughs> um, we do, we do, throughout like the that. year we put a little bit together yep. and then we kind of let it sit. Okay cool yeah, that's working and then we put a little bit more together it must be pretty intense when it gets to blending time because do you feel any pressure to there's huge amounts of pressure do you do you do reference do you do like a reference point or something say the previous couple of vintages do you just 
being able to try wines, you know, from the yeah. previous years. And, and the great thing is being able to be here for 20 years, 21 years, yeah. you, you kind of get to know, it's you a have lot some of that history. Memory. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you get to know the vineyards, you know, we, we grow uh, 90, I think what, 98% of all the Sangiovese that we have, that we get, and, and uh, the others that we, we buy from, we have, we're out there and out those fields too. So we have say on what's going on. So we grow it and we make it, big difference. I yes. can walk out to the vineyards. I was doing tractor work today. And that's the thing is we farm it, we make it. So we kind of get an idea of what these vines are gonna do. Cause yeah. Sangiovese is tricky. And one day you'll love it, especially when it's young. The next day you think oh, I'm, I'm gonna lose my job. <laughs> And, yep. and it does this bit, and it does the same thing out in the vineyard as it's ripening. Wow. One day it tastes great, you know, okay, hold on. Next day, ah, the flavors aren't there yet, and it kind of does this up and down, and pretty soon it hits. I don't know if I could handle the pressure of, you know, just the, the vineyard side of things. You know, it's, you have acres of these grapes, and it's a lot riding on it. You have to get it right. You spend a lot of time out there. <laughs> you know, it, which is good. Every day is something a, little, something a little bit different, and we can spend a lot of time. I'm fortunate enough to be able to go out to the vineyards and wow. spend time and taste and, 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 and get to know these things. That's a lot. That pulls you in a, a lot of directions. Yeah. Wow. But my, my biggest, uh, one of the biggest, you mentioned about pressure, one of the biggest things is, is we, we're just getting wrapped up with harvest this year, but is when do we start picking? because there's yeah. nothing I can do to go put them back. <laughs> Once we pick, we no, pick. No, too early. Let's put them back yeah. on the vines. <laughs> and and it, it comes from learning, making those yeah. mistakes and going, yeah, that was, now we got to do something different. And then you spend the rest of that vintage struggling to, yeah. to correct it. And so with all these different lots that we do, we have, that's how we were able to blend yeah. and, and create, because some we do, uh, we'll take pungents, brand new pungents, that one's ugly. It got water on it yeah. and we'll ferment in those, we'll ferment in half ton bins, we have punch down tanks, we have uh, submerged cap tanks that we use, something's always a little different yeah. and there's really no recipe other than the basics, yeah. add yeast, hopefully it'll ferment and get alcohol, yeah. everything from that you got to be flexible on. Yeah, yeah, it gives you some creative freedom there. Yeah. Wow, that's nice, yeah. that's impressive. Um, so speaking of harvest, yeah. how has it gone this year? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's been, uh, it goes along with this year. It's kind of been goofy. Uh, Man. We started off early, uh, going great guns. We thought we were going to be done in probably three or four weeks, maybe three. And then uh, the, the weather changed a little bit, put the brakes on it's everything, and weather. then it dwindled. And we finally got done. It took us about 55 days to get done. And the last half of it was just little bits and pieces coming in. And, but well, it's Mother Nature, you gotta deal with it. Yeah. And, and 2020 has been one hell of a year, yeah. just all across the board. Color's been good, flavor's been good, everything went dry, which is, there's no stock fermentations. Uh, awesome. Yeah, so <laughs> tank, all the technical stuff. Yeah. It's been good. Grapes have been clean. Okay. We haven't experienced oh, a bunch of mold, okay. stuff okay. like that. So everything on that end's great. It's just timing was a little bit different. Yeah, man. Um, what about, uh, I mean, fortunately there weren't any major fires up here, but was, are you anticipating any effects or? Uh, the thing that we had, which we never really had much of before, we were inundated with ash. Yeah. Uh, we started machine picking a couple of years ago and I run out ahead of it and I uh, hedge the vines yeah. to, so they don't get tore up. Yeah. And I thought, what's this stuff in front of me? Usually it's oh, dust and yeah. stuff. And we, I, the sunlight came and I was black with ash, black and gray oh, with ash. Man. And it's like, oh, gee, there's ash, now what? You know. And we seen it in the bins. Every day we had to wash out the <sighs> bins and you could see there's just ash. Everything from that we've noticed has settled down into the primary leaves. Okay. And there's been no effect. Okay. Yeah. You know, well, here, we'll knock on wood. Yes. <laughs> uh, as far as smoke, we were very smoky for a long time, and I haven't tasted, but we haven't tested for it either. But we, none of the lots that we made have shown any signs of smoke paint. Okay. We were uh, 
And that might have had something to do with ripening because we didn't see the sun for a few days up here. Once wow. the winds blew around yeah. and we had all the fires going around, it's just, okay, we're going to get it by some point. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the other winemakers I've been talking to this year, um, especially closer to, you know, the, the epicenters yeah. of the fires, they've just, some of them just said 2020, they're not doing anything. You know, yeah. it's just incredible. Some, uh, some others just left the grapes on the vine. I, I've seen a lot of grapes last week in, in, throughout uh, uh, up in the Sonoma and area. That's I'm really heartbreaking because there's oh. such an outlay of resources up front and you don't really start getting a return but five years down the road. Two and, to five, yeah. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's just... It, it's rough. It, it, yeah. It's definitely, you know, it, it breaks, breaks my heart, breaks a lot of people's hearts that to see that. Yeah, uh, and dude. especially for for the for the smaller wineries, you know, it's it's a it, you can't maneuver. Sometimes you know it's that could make or break them. Oh, definitely. Uh, what what production size do you guys are you running typically? We jump around, but uh, we're primarily around eight thousand cases, yeah. eight to ten. And uh, what are we about? 5,000 overall cases of Sangiovese, or are we up to about 6,000 between, between, between the reserve and all of our block lines? So that's, that, yeah, that's your flagship That's right there. the yeah. thing. We do yeah. make the, the free blow, a little sparkly Moscato. That wine is a killer. It's a, si it's a sneaky one. That, yeah. is, that is awesome. It's so tasty. Yeah. And the format you, you, you guys have with the, the little cans, oh. that's just perfect. I don't, yeah. Who came up with that? That's that's a great idea. I, I don't know where that came from, but uh, it, it was yeah. No, it works well in the cans for sure. Now it's, it's been our our little bubbly nightmare that we get to deal with too. Uh, but we do about a thousand cases to fifteen hundred cases of that. We do do a little bit of Zen, and we do a little bit of Barbera. Oh, I think I did try some this oddballs. in the tasting room yeah. once before. Yeah, yeah, we do have some oddballs that yeah. we kind of play with, too. I saw, did I see you looking at uh, some more of the obscure grapes? Was it Tariga or, uh, uh, we or, have, or Nebbiolo uh, or something? We have, we I bought this year San Grantino. Oh, okay. And then we also have... Uh, uh, Teraldigo. Oh, it's Teraldigo, sorry. Yes. It's Teraldigo, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we get that from Herringer's down okay. in uh, Clarksburg. Yeah. And that's so, where the bulk of our musk at. Yeah, we do have it. Oh, okay. So is that like a side, just creative? Jim Goulet. Yeah. Jim and Susie own the place, but Jim, he loves to play around. Yeah. He and has to, yeah. with that, I'm able to go, hey, these guys got this trawl to go down here or any other kind of grape. And if we think it will work, we, we usually try it for a couple of years. It'd be interesting to see what you do with oh, it. Is, so far, and it's, uh, Something for the club, maybe something for us to keep yeah. it interesting, yeah. or something that we might be able to do a blend with. Like, it's kind of fun doing yeah. some blends. Yeah. We got a couple goofy, I shouldn't say goofy, probably not the right word, but some uh, interesting blends coming out here nice. next year. Nice, yeah. wow. Uh, so what do we have here? This line? is uh, our 2017 Reserva Sangiovese. This is the Reserva? Yes. I, so the difference I remember was um, a little more barrel aging? A little bit more barrel aging and everything gets, all the Sangiovese gets aged in, in, in French oak, 130 gallon pungents, uh, something we got from the old country. And the Reserva tends to be where the, the Ramallah or the Sangiovese tends to be a real food friendly Chianti style kind of wine. Yeah. This is a little bit more stand on its own, maybe not so food friendly ish. But a it has bit a little bigger. more silky yeah. mouthfeel. And it's I like that. mainly the Brunello clones in it that we have. And in some years, there might be like maybe a touch of Barbera or a touch of something if I feel there's a hole or something that we need kind of tweaking. That's the one I can step out of the box a little bit and not keep it 100% Sangiovese. Ah, uh, okay. If it is, great. If it's not, it, uh, Jim and Susie are okay with that too. So. Oh, okay. So it's actually different because I, I remember those one, one year I was here and I, I did a side-by-side -side in the tasting room. I actually took a couple of bottles back to do side-by-sides. Okay. And I think I did that on my last review. Um, and I noticed, oh yeah, it doesn't, okay, 
Sanjay Basic. Interesting. Yeah. I noticed, yeah, it was, it was much more, had a much more silky mouth feel, yeah. and a nice body, and then this, the Sangiovese, the flagship, was you know, very classic. Sit. Yeah, it's very, you know, it's like, it's got California fruit, we, I kind of describe it, it's, it's traditional Italian Sangiovese, but a little California fruit put in on the top. I love the color, man. Yeah. And it's, it's beautiful. It, it's, those have been our two wines forever i mean was there a choice behind the sangiovese grape or that's how the estate came that uh, jim and Susie, that's what they wanted okay. uh they in their career they came from walnut creek yeah. and they they wanted to own a vineyard one day yeah. and you know they went and looked at napa but even in the 70s and whatnot napa was getting too nice. expensive yeah. And so we can't buy land here. They kind of looked at Sonoma and somebody said, hey, have you ever thought about up here? And so they came up, looked around, thought, okay. So they went down to Daryl Cordy, now Cordy Brothers, and talked to him a little bit. And he suggested, well, you like food wines and stuff. Why don't you look at Sangiovese? Yeah. And so they went to Italy for two visits. And he set up little tours and stuff for them. And they liked the grape. And so that's what they wanted here. So nice. through friendships and arrangements been made. They took uh, like our Dos Ojis, the original Il Bajon clone, Montevina winery had it and they were gonna get rid of it. So they went over and pruned it and that came over in a suitcase, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so they wow. went over and pruned it and put it in their backyard in Lafayette nice. and grew it until they got enough cuttings to where they have grafted. And nice. then, uh, oh wow, the, yeah, so yeah. they actually grew their own cuttings in, in their backyard. That must have taken how many years? A couple years wow. to get enough budwood to yeah. take to a nursery to get the first couple acres out here. Damn, and, and knowing where that wood came from, and then, uh, like the Pepe, or it's, it's these names are all confusing here, so I'll speak in tasting room language <laughs> or marmalata. Is, is the cuttings originally originally came from beyond the Sante over in Italy. So Bob Pepe and Jim Gillette both went to the same college. Oh, nice. Years later or at some point they realized that what they both had and they said, well, I'll trade you cuttings, I'll trade you cuttings. So that's cool. where we ended up with those. He got some Il Pujon and we got some beyond the Sante. Uh, the Solia Elena well, came from Italy too in a barrel basically <laughs> cuttings that he, they met the folks over there oh yeah we'll get you and cut them up put them in the barrel and ship them over and that's how the budwood came over wow you know in those days wow i mean <laughs> talk about a, of having a vision and just chipping away at it that's what made years it years nice. at a time because when i came here 100 percent, we didn't have to figure out where they were going they already knew that part this uh, is what we want got you oh Thank God. Yeah. Okay, we'll, 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 we can work with this. Yeah. And so it made my job a little easier yeah, because it has been focused. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. This is what we do. All you right. know, that's one thing I noticed is that um, your lineup is has always been focused. You know, a, a lot of a lot of the winemakers you go, you visit the wineries, they, they they tend to diversify. Sometimes overly so, but yeah. you know, that's here nor there. But it's just an interesting observation that I made. Well, and I, th I think that's uh, the, either the winemaker or the winery owner trying to figure out what they want to do. Yeah, what's their strength? And, and Jim and Susie are very, it's what they call it, very analytical. Yeah, They're, that's they me. <laughs> spreadsheets and stuff like that. And yeah. so the thought that, that they put behind it is the reason why it's doing so well now. Yeah. Okay, we have good grapes. As long as we can keep them clean and we don't screw them up in the winery, they should make pretty good wine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I mean, that's just, I mean, it's a, it's a yeah. natural life cycle on a grape. <laughs> yeah. And we take it, we interrupt it, and we do our bit with it. And as long as I can keep it clean, yes. keep it healthy, it should make good wine. Do you have nightmares about wine? <laughs> I wouldn't call them nightmares, but I, yeah, there, there's always I, some sleepless. Or you wake up in the middle of the night going, what was that? Yeah, I, 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 used, to, I used to do, a, a, several years ago, I indulged in home wine making, and that was a very humbling, humbling exercise. And it gave me a whole new level of appreciation for what winemakers do, <laughs> especially when you're working at this scale. But I remember we would obsess over 
any foreign or was there a possibility did we mess something up in the prepping i mean it was we're very we're very paranoid about it you you have to have some of that to you because yeah. I, i think that once you think that you got it all figured out it's going to bite you <laughs> it's going to bite you real hard so there's always something to keep you humble yeah whether if it's a stuck thermostat on a tank or you get home and you wake up in the middle of the night going did i close that did i do something yeah. to come back and double check in the middle of the night okay now it's fine i did we did we did do it right or something it is a humbling experience and i think you you got to be a little scared sometimes to yeah. to do this i mean <laughs> i don't i don't sleep really good until december 9th that's we'll get our free blow out and bottled and done and that's our big push because there's what how many club members that want their case before christmas oh 500 so i mean the wednesday after the bottling truck pulls out we're going to pack like 300 cases to ship off for christmas <laughs> and so to have the filter and you don't want down, you don't want get, to piss them off <laughs> no and get that wine stable <laughs> enough to bottle and then that's when david my my assistant and we kind of go <laughs> okay now let's move on to christmas <laughs> right now you <laughs> yeah. have to <laughs> yeah and other things but no that's what's going on so we got uh, secondary fermentation going on we still have some primary fermentation going on we're getting back into our normal cellar hygiene practices of checking free so two on the older blocks yeah uh we got to start thinking of blends uh for this upcoming year plus you know we like to say we're not doing nothing out in the vineyard till January but I'm put getting ready to put some cover crop in right now wow yeah so it never ends yeah i mean you're done with harvest now you have to start prepping for the next cycle yeah. again cuz we'll start pruning in we like to prune in march later march we like the last ones because you talk about frost yeah. and and we 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 won't prune till the very end to try and stave off fro- any frost damage because we don't have fans we don't have anything yeah. like that. Yeah. So we just try and prune and deal with it like have that. Have you ever had a frost episode? We've been touched by it, but not completely frosted. We've had it where a frost got us and, and we went out and noticed that all the fruit was on the on the it was on tongue tied sorry about that time of day. <laughs> the fruit was all on the suckers and the secondary shoots. So if we went out and just told our crews or had our crews, "Hey, let's go sucker and all this." That's where the fruit was. Oh. And there was no fruit on the primary canes. Goofy, but we only be figured that it had to be a frost. And the only way you know this is you have you walk the vines. Yeah, I walk it. I see I see videos on your on Instagram you oh. walking the vines and like <laughs> yeah it's, and it's, it's just interesting I keep thinking I'm like yep that's that's what it takes right there yeah, yeah. oh no it is uh there's a one of the growers I learned a lot from up here who also owns a winery Tom Dillian Dillian wines he told me years ago uh you don't know what's going on out there unless you put boot boot tracks in in the field yeah. you, you don't have a clue you, you know we we can't drive by and look Yeah. <laughs> you know, it'd be nice, but we yeah. got to walk it. Yeah, you know, there's just no other way around. Wow. And and it's not bad. This is yeah. it's it could be worse. Well, I mean, for <laughs> me, I, I think that's the perfect synergy where you know, a, a good winemaker has to be involved in the field as well. He has to be a good grower. I think it helps. Yeah. No. Yes, absolutely. I mean, to to really know what they're starting with and be able yeah. to influence it and they can take their knowledge in the cellar through the process and affect the following vintage and keep that cycle going. Well, you know, talk about that like the zin that we make, the original Grand Pierre zin. I've been dealing with that vineyard since 83. Wow. You know, when I started in the wine making business. I was a junior in high school. <laughs> you have been in wine yeah. pretty much your entire and, life. <laughs> and I used to help Scott and Terry Harvey prune it, cut suckers out of it, just do whatever. You know, now I understand why um some a lot of the artisan winemakers that I thought they have been following they seek sometimes a lot of them will seek grapes from these coveted vineyards and now understand why they all flock to these very specific vineyards because yeah. they know the grower and they know what they do and they know they're very much in touch there's a bit of history involved or you know uh uh 
Yeah, you explained it pretty good. I mean, it's just there's something there that that might not be explainable, but you get you get to know when they're individuals. doing the right things. They're yeah. doing what you do. Yeah, here every day. And, and you know, it's just that's how how we grew up doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is this is this all the what you're aging now? Yes. So this is combination of 2019 and 2020. Uh, wow. Yeah, we got a little bit of Heinz 57 going on here. It's uh, it, it's, it's crazy how you know this. You think uh, you said what 8,000 cases or something? Yeah, about. Yeah, it, it's crazy. Like you think 8,000, but then these barrels make it look so small, but they're actually pretty huge. <laughs> yeah. Well, like the pungents, they're 130 gallons a piece. So oh, wow. normally it's 50 cases, I'd say, per pungent, the barrel gets you 25. Nice. And we do, we still have, uh, they're sit we still have uh, 4,500 gallons sitting in tanks that, that as we bring up um, the 19s to get them ready for bottle, those will go back down in those barrels. So Nocheto, Nocheto is pretty much an estate only uh, production? Pretty much, yes. Okay. So production is pretty much going to stay at that, at those levels? Yeah, this year we took a, we're down 20% on our grapes, but it's almost a normal year. The last couple of years have been above. So okay. to those have a little bit of reduction, we're, 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 we're fine. We're, we're you know, it, it's a pleasure, you know, to, to, to be down a little bit, but, um, the other thing, too, is as we cycle, we can't we can't buy enough barrels or keep enough barrels in here to to put everything in the barrels right away and whatnot. So there is a little bit of uh, cycle that we have to do between the pungents and what we're trying with these Pirels and and there's a quick turnover at this stage of the winemaking process. Right? Oh yes, yeah. maybe a couple of years stops and then you know, or yeah, eighteen months yeah. And then. The yeah, rest is it, just yeah, somewhere in there. Cool. Nice. <laughs> and then our, our biggest challenge right now, the little bit of white wine that we have here, we have stickers up on the top, the big letters, white wine, yeah. so we don't <laughs> top with red wine. Oh, yes, yeah, so we're top with red wine. <laughs> Has know, that happened before? <laughs> yeah, it, it did at my, where, where I used to work. You know, and so I started, we tag all the white barrels with white wine up right by the bone. That's and funny. So <laughs> we hope to move things around and have, as, as we make a little bit more white wine in barrels, we're going to dedicate a whole row and just shove it all in there. So, so right now, the only white wine you make is the, the Frivolo. Frivolo. And then we used to do a Pinot Grigio, and this is the first year we haven't did Pinot Grigio for eight, nine years, I think. And uh, we opted to start using our own Trebbiano to make white wine with. Okay. And so, and then we also do uh, what we call a Sangiovese Bianco, where we take uh, the Sangiovese and we pick it in 40 pound lug boxes and we dump those into the press and just squeeze it a little bit and, and we get, try and get that clear juice. And, and we make it a white, basically it's a white Sangiovese, but it's not white Zen, right. it's not pink, it's actually pure white. And by squeezing it soft and whatnot, we only get about 40 gallons a ton when we oh, do that. Wow. And uh, we don't get that color because, you know, red wine takes skin contact and all that. Well, we eliminate the skin contact. It comes out a little pink, but with aging and when we'll surly it, we'll stir up the leaves a little bit. That leaves will grab the color and drop it out. Oh, wow. And it'll be white. I wonder what, what does that taste like? Tyler, you want to answer that? It's been a <laughs> while since I had that. You've, <laughs> I get rid of it here, and then I, sometimes I forget to go taste it again. The San Giovese Bianco, I remember stuff, but uh, the, 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 when you search for perfection, the Japanese have, there is no such thing as perfection because, you know, if it's per perfect, then what else you got to do? You know, what? Yeah. Why, why go on? If you find or you make something that's perfect, then, 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 what's the sense in being around anymore. Harvest is just done. Uh, we have our last little two fer fer fermentations going. Uh, as you can tell, everything's a little bit dry. We have absolutely no rain this year. We usually have a couple inches by now, yeah. which is, we're irrigating like crazy right now a little bit, trying to give, give them a little drink before they go to bed. <coughs> 
So this block here, what I'm saying is our Noche No block that we have. So this has been in the ground since 1999. It has one of each of our clones in it. So it has Bill Pajon, it has Altacina, it has Beyonde Sante, and it has cuttings from Isolia Elena in it. And this is the Il Pajon. It's, uh, like I said, the leaves are starting to turn and whatnot. Some are, are brown already. Probably a little machine picking damage. We switched a couple years ago to machine pick. Yeah. And it's been working well for us. Yeah. But it's just. It's a lot of work too. Yeah. I mean, prior to a machine, how, how long did it take to, uh, to do harvest? We can do, we can roughly do, if we start at three o'clock in the morning, We'll do 15 tons in, uh, I don't know, two, three hours, depending on how fast it's going. Wow. And, but we pick over a month and a half here. So all these different clones, they all ripen up different. That's so true. usually the Altacena will start in uh, Labor Day weekend-ish. And then uh, the Solia Lena will be next from the Chianti clones. And then our other vineyard, the Hillside Vineyard, across the street from us will get ready. This is typically some of the late, later ones, the Brunello Cone. And like I said, there's, it's, it's a little, there's a few little stragglers left here that the machine didn't get, but uh, they basically, oh yeah, we ir we <laughs> irrigated some raisins. them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we put a couple inches of water out here, trying to make up for what we haven't got yet. And, uh, and then we'll put these guys to bed. And These vines are old. Yeah, 1999. So. Wow. That's, we, that's we farm nice. about four tons an acre. We do about six positions on, on, a, on a cordon. I mean, nothing real fancy as far as uh, trellising or whatnot. Yeah. We do the standard like two buds per cane, two canes per spur here. And you can kind of see this is, yeah, that's part of the damage here. So we have the two canes. And uh, so, yeah, now it's just uh, repair time, uh, fix a few things and, and try and get these guys to go sleep for a little bit and wake them back up in May nice. again. Winemakers are some of the most interesting people you're probably ever going to meet. They carry with them a wealth of experience and knowledge. They catalog every last detail of every vintage and every wine they've ever made. What you see here, or what you saw today, was just a snippet of that. Uh, Rusty has been cataloging and making amazing wines here for several decades, and it shows in the wines. Their consistency, the quality, the nuance, and the way they represent the terroir here. It's definitely been an honor to finally meet Rusty. I've only been drinking his wine, enjoying his wines for well over a decade. So it's definitely been an honor to come out and meet with him. And I most certainly want to thank the folks at Vino Nocetto for hosting me today. I look forward to coming back and looking at some of their wines, more of their wines over time. Uh, some of the wines that have stood out to me today are their Alianico, the Misto, those are showing really well, and there's a few others, and I look forward to featuring those and exploring those and sharing those notes with you. So I hope you enjoyed today's excursion with Vino Nocero, and uh, let me know in the comments below if you have any thoughts or any ideas or other wineries you'd like me to take a look at. And uh, until then, cheers wine snobs.